right, welcome back, beautiful students. Um, this is a screencast to introduce to you um, the prologue to the tragedy of Romeo and Juliet, um, not only as a overview of the entire plot of the play, but also to introduce to you this form of poems, a traditional poem called a sonnet. Now, some of you may have studied these in the past. Some of you might be brand new to you. Um, but Shakespeare utilizes this sonnet format for this introduction to his play, even though the actual format of poetry is meant to be a singular poem um, that can stand by itself. So you'll notice that I had asked you to TP cast. And what do I mean by that? Well, of course, the first thing you want to do is look at the fact that this is a prologue, right? That's kind of the title of this piece. And you want to predict, well, what does a prologue do? Usually it comes before the story. So maybe you're thinking it's going to be an introduction, okay? Um, the next thing that we um, want to do in the TP cast is paraphrase. So that's what I'm going to show you how to do um, as we go through the poem here. Now, the part about Shakespeare um, when it comes to reading him, as it does with most poetry, is you want to look for the end punctuation because that tells you where a sentence ends. And when you can find that end punctuation or a piece of punctuation that could act like a period, right, like a semicolon here, um, you want to go ahead and circle it because that's going to tell you that, okay, I can stop at this point and actually paraphrase or put into my own words what is being said. So the first line says, two households both alike in dignity. Well, there's two households, right? So two houses and they're both dignified equally. Notice how Shakespeare puts both households or both families on this even playing field. So two houses both dignified. In fair Verona where we lay our scene, line two. Set in Verona. From ancient grudge break to new mutiny. All right, so we got grudge and mutiny. Notice how these are both fighting words, right? But one's ancient and one's new, right? So from an old fight comes a new one. Now notice how Shakespeare doesn't give us background on that old fight because it doesn't matter. What matters is because it's making civil blood, um, making civil hands unclean. Now this is a little pun here, a play on the word civil. Civil meaning civilized, being able to um, negotiate and without emotion come up with um, remedies for a situation. But here he's saying that this old fight that's starting a new one makes people who were civilized now become unclean. So from an old fight comes a new one and civilized people are no longer civilized. Okay. So right here in the first four lines, we basically get the exposition of the story, right? We got the characters, um, we've got the setting, but now we've got conflict. And so we've got the beginning part of our story. Now the next four lines, which end in a period here, are going to give us more information. From forth the fatal loins of these two foes. Fatal loins. Now, loins are a representation of childbirth, um, and he calls these two families foes, but from, so both families... give birth to a pair of star-crossed lovers who take their life. 
Notice that both families give birth to babies who fall in love and commit suicide. Ooh, pretty powerful in those two lines. Now, talking about the foes, the two families, their misadventured, piteous overthrows. Oh, nope, reverse. Sorry. Whose is a reference to the star-crossed lovers? Their misadventured, piteous overthrows. So they're over, overly piteous gestures, right? This fact that they killed themselves do with their deaths bury the strife. So they end their parents' feud. Boom. So we've got the whole story in the first eight lines of the sonnet. Now, let's look at the next four lines. The fearful passage of their death-marked love. So, the story of their tragic love. And the continuance of their parents' rage. So, the story of their tragic love and their parents' anger which but their children's end not could remove nothing which nothing lesser than death could remove Is now the two hours traffic of our stage. Is now our play. So here in the last two lines, we've got the final sentence. The which if you with patient ears attend, what here shall miss, our toil shall strive to mend. Right? So if you listen... just in case you missed anything here. Here. Our toil or our hard work on stage We'll cover it. Boom. So now what I'd like to bring you through is when it goes to the TP cast, the connotation. Now when we talk about connotation, I want you guys to highlight figures of speech, right? Diction. Sound devices. Once you've done that, you should be able to describe the attitude of the narrator, or in this case, the chorus, who's introducing the story. You should be able to find their attitude. Now, when it comes to a sonnet, the shift is very important. In a traditional sonnet, there will be a shift, a clear shift between lines eight and nine. Oftentimes what you're gonna find is in the first eight lines, you are usually given some sort of introduction to the topic, some information and description. 
Now, if you notice in this piece, the first eight lines give us the entire story, right? What happens with the two houses and what happened at the end, okay? Now, after that line eight, when we get to lines nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, and 14, the last lines usually will comment on what was already stated. Sometimes it could negate it. What do I mean by that? It could be opposite. Like say in the first eight lines, the author said the subject was absolutely beautiful, like the sunshine is golden and fresh every morning. But in the last six lines, they could negate that and say, but the storms close in and take away the light and blah, 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 right? So they'll usually comment on it. They'll negate it. Sometimes they'll elaborate on the same subject. But the key here is in these last two lines or this final couplet is usually will you find the main message in any sonnet, okay? So pay attention to that shift between lines 8 and 9 um, and make sure you annotate what you believe that shift stands for. Revisit the title again, see if you think it's truly what you thought before, and then think of the theme. What is the main message so far from just this little piece that you read? Beautiful. Now that you've gotten a nice introduction to the play and overview of what's going to happen, you should be able to tackle Act 1 on your own. Um, I've attached an audiobook to Schoology if you'd like to listen to it too so you can appreciate the poetry a little bit more. It's also better to kind of listen to the story with um, several voices taking place of the characters. Um, but you are required to annotate as you actively read, and don't forget to review the questions at the end in preparation for a quiz. Have a beautiful week.